This is the practice exercise from page 441 in the textbook. We're looking at enthalpy changes when we're cooling a substance and also changing its phase. So in order to do this with water, you want to remember what that heating curve for water looks like. So I'm just going to sketch that real quickly here. As so if we have a graph, we're going to put energy added on the x-axis. And then temperature on the y-axis. And the way that this looks is we start with a solid at some temperature and we raise the temperature of that solid until we get to the melting point. And then we have this horizontal line while we are melting the substance. And then we have another slope line while we're heating up that liquid. And then once we've gotten that liquid to its boiling point, we have another flat line as we phase change from a liquid to a gas. And then the last part of that curve is where we increase the temperature of the gas. So this represents a gas that this is a liquid, and then it's a solid down here at the bottom. And if we look at the information they're giving us, they are telling us the specific heat of ice. So the specific heat of ice is going to be helpful when we're raising the temperature of that solid ice. So we're going to need the specific heat of ice in this range. The specific heat of liquid water is when we are raising the temperature or cooling liquid water. So that's going to be helpful in this range. And the specific heat of steam would be helpful if we were raising or lowering the temperature of the gas phase. The heat of fusion tells you how much energy is required to go between the solid and the liquid phases. So that's here. Heat of fusion is when we go between these phases. And then heat of vaporization is when we're going between liquid and gas. So that is helpful at this point on that heating curve. So you can see different information depending on what you're doing, if you're heating cooling or if you're changing phase. So if we read through our problem, it wants to know the enthalpy change during the process in which we take 100 grams of water starting at 50 degrees C. So that means we're starting probably about here on that curve and we're cooling it to ice at negative 30 degrees C. So what that means is we're cooling down our liquid water, then we are changing its phase until it's ice, and then we're cooling down that ice until it's at negative 30 degrees C. So we see that there's going to be three steps to this calculation, taking our liquid water at 50 degrees C, cooling it down to zero degrees C so that we can do that phase change, and the phase change from liquid to solid, and then cooling down that solid from zero degrees C to negative 30 degrees C. So three separate calculations. Again, when you do these problems, you're going to have a lot of information to work with, so it's helpful to think about this heating curve of water, figure out where you're starting, where you're ending, and how many calculations it's going to require. Again, I can tell that it's three calculations because I'm going through three segments. So let's start by doing the first calculation while we are cooling the liquid water. So first calculation, cooling liquid water. Now this calculation should look pretty straightforward because in order to do this calculation, again, we're in this part of the curve, so we know that we need the specific heat of liquid water. This is a calculation we've done before with the Q equals MC delta T. So in this case, Q is going to be equal to the mass, which is 100 grams, times the specific heat, which is 4.14 joules per gram Kelvin. And then we're going to do our temperature change, which is in Kelvin. Now it needs to be final minus initial. For this portion of the curve, our final temperature is 0 degrees Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. And our initial temperature is up here, that's the 50 degrees Celsius, which is going to be 323 Kelvin. So notice that when I do this calculation, all my units are going to cancel out, grams are going to cancel here, Units of Kelvin are going to cancel here, so I'm going to be left in units of joules, which makes sense since I am looking for the amount of energy. Also notice that my delta T term is going to be negative, and it's going to be negative because I'm going to a colder temperature. So again, remember, it's final minus initial. So I'm going to have a negative value here, which means my Q is going to be a negative number. So I'm going to get negative 20900 joules going to be easier to see in kilojoules, so negative 20.9 kilojoules. So that's how much energy needs to be lost in order to cool down the liquid water. Now we're ready for the second step of the calculation, which is here, 
when we undergo the phase change. And we said in order to do the phase change, we need the information about the heat of fusion. Notice that the units for the heat of fusion are different units. Instead of joules per gram Kelvin, we have kilojoules per mole. So what this means is we need to know how many moles of water we have. So if we've got 100 grams of water, and we know that every mole of water weighs 18 grams, because that's one oxygen and two hydrogens, that means that we have 5.56 moles of water. So, all we need in order to figure out how much energy for that ice formation, we know Q is going to be equal to how much water we have, which is 5.56 moles, times the amount of energy required to do that, which is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Now the heat of fusion is how much energy I need to put in to melt the ice. Since we're trying to form the ice, we know we're going to need to release that amount of energy. So we're going to put a negative sign in our calculation. So in this case, Q is still going to be a negative number because we're still releasing energy in order to form that ice. So this calculation is going to come out to negative 33.4 kilojoules. So we can see that it's taking a lot more energy in order to do the phase change. And that makes sense. We're releasing a lot of energy in order to get those particles to become closer to each other and increase those intermolecular attractions. So now the last step of this calculation, we have cooled down our liquid water. We have changed our liquid water into solid. Now we need to cool our solid. Since we are cooling the ice, we can go back to using the heat capacity or specific heat of the ice, which means we're back to our Q equals MC delta T. So we have the same 100 grams. Now our specific heat is different because it's a solid, so it's 2.03 joules per gram Kelvin. Again, our delta T is going to be final minus initial. Our final temperature is at negative 30 degrees C, which is 243 Kelvin. And our initial temperature where we started is at zero degrees C, so that is 273 Kelvin. Again, we know that our units are gonna cancel out here, the grams cancel, the Kelvin cancels, leaving us with units of joules. Again, notice that my change in temperature is gonna give me a negative number because I'm cooling down my substance. Makes sense, this should be an exothermic reaction because we need to release heat in order to cool down our ice. If you do this calculation, you should end up with negative 6090 joules, which we'll rewrite as six, negative 6.09 kilojoules. So now that we've done all of the individual calculations, we need to put this together and find that the total heat released is going to be equal to the amount of heat released cooling down the liquid water, which was 20.9 kilojoules, added to the heat released to form the ice, which is negative 33.4 kilojoules, added to the amount of heat released when we cool down that ice, which was negative 6.09 kilojoules. So our total is going to be negative 60.4 kilojoules of heat were released when this liquid water was cooled from 50 degrees Celsius down to ice at negative 30 degrees Celsius. And again, when you perform these calculations, you're gonna to wanna to think about the heating curve in order to figure out how many steps you need to go through. Do the steps individually. You're gonna to have to do individual calculations because it's a slightly different setup depending on if you're just changing the temperature of a substance or if you're doing a phase change. Notice that when we were doing the phase change, there's no temperature involved because during a phase change, the temperature remains constant. So different calculations for a temperature change than for a phase change. And then after you perform the individual calculations, you just add them all up to get your total enthalpy change, in this case, our total heat released because we knew that we were cooling our substance.